Okay, so we've met William, we've met Chris, uh, Chris Robinson, we've got two Chris's. <laughs> so we've got a Chris R and a Chris G. Um, and so we've got Chris Gilbert from Philip 66 and Sri Kumar from PWC. So uh, Chris from Philip 66, would you like to give us a small introduction, followed by yourself, Sri? Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Chris Gilbert, and I uh, work Philip 66 at Humber Refinery, uh, and I manage all our decarbonisation projects. And uh, we've got a big ambition, and we'll uh, talk about one of our projects. We've got several more, how to decarbonise uh, the refinery. Um, so we uh, produce uh, around 20% uh, of the country's road fuels. Um, but we don't just make diesel and petrol, so uh, we also make other products used by society and there's going to be a demand for that in the future. So we believe it's still relevant, but we need to, as society, uh, learn to make those products in a lower carbon intensive way. So we're looking at carbon capture, we're looking at hydrogen, green and blue, uh, but we're also looking at our SCO3 products as well. So. Uh, we've been running used cooking oil for several years now. That's allowed us to make sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, we've got multi-year contracts with British Airways for that. That's the first at scale production of SAF. Uh, and also what's unique uh, for our refinery is we make synthetic graphite coke, uh, which is a key component for uh, electric vehicle batteries. So we see ourselves in the UK um, being part of uh, an ambitious uh, manufacturing supply chain for the EV industry. Uh, so um, those, we're going to talk about what we require uh, for that, but that's a general overview uh, of what we do at Philips. Hi, and my name is Shrikumar Rakshi. I'm a director in PwC Strategy and basically the strategy consulting part of PwC. Uh, a large part of my work is around decarbonization and net zero. Advising Fortune 500 companies, large E houses, specifically help them understand what, how can they decarbonize and uh, using different pathways and technologies. Uh, so that's my, that's 80% of my day job, apart from other stuff. I also work a lot, quite a bit with uh, the climate tech startups uh, as part of the pro bono. <coughs> effort from PwC and also from advisory angle. Um, before that, I was at ArcelorMittal leading their major strategy development, both from corporate angle, but also I worked with the plan on the plant side. So I also think that respects to the challenges you face at the plant level or site level. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the introductions. So I think we just want to go back a little bit to what Chris was talking about and how he cut short a little bit on the carbon accounting, which I think is very um, critical at this point in time. People need to know um, what's going to happen in terms of CO2 ownership, uh, which is no doubt a big conundrum. What happens, say, to companies like ENI as an example? So they're obviously producing, uh, utilizing their old infrastructure, uh, towards CCS, uh, they're, they're capturing other people's CO2 emissions. And to go back to the question that a member of the audience posed earlier on, could there be a possibility of selling high quality carbon removal offsets here in the UK? Is this is the possibility of creating this revenue stream going to become a potential reality? That's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, <laughs> coming in for a really just a technical point of view around the uh, a business point of view, commercial point of view, but it was really to, to recognise some of the things that are actually done in our industries and that um, if you just focus on the scope one emissions, then you're not really looking at the whole uh, greenhouse gas protocol setup, the scope two and three as well, and you're not taking into consider life cycle issues and life cycle assessment as well. So that's what we do in that carbon accounting methodology. And I can give you, you know, quite a lot of diverse examples of, of, of where this is important. So if you I get the example of, of, of e-fuels, circular economy, sorry, no, uh, uh, biofuels and so on. Um, uh, and, and that's really important because I think it's, you know, we're clearly going to be using more of those biofuels um, in, in road transports up until, you know, for the next 10, 15 years. 
so they're in place, but then uh, staff is going to be important in the longer term as well. If you look at uh, biomass burning plants and connect those to CCS, or you've got energy from waste and you connect those to CCS, those are both big um, potential negative emitters, which are really, really important. And at the moment, I haven't seen a, a methodology or a mechanism to draw this all together. You know, we there are uh, yeah, 20, 30, 40 different pieces of research um, that um, all look at different carbon accounting methodologies, and all these different, you know, the, and they're fit for different arrangements in different organisations. Uh, I know a couple of industrial clusters have, have done literature surveys on those and, and, and looked at, uh, you know, maybe combining some of those methodologies. And what we try to do in our clusters is to say, you know, define one methodology that is that fits all basically. So it's designed for um, uh, single industrials or as a whole cluster. You can look at the the, uh, the, the carbon count of the whole cluster. And it's also designed so different people can come in at different speeds. And I think you probably all recognise if you're going to catch scope two and scope three emissions in particular, there's an awful lot of data you've got to get. You know, if you're thinking about you know the paper clips that are brought to your office and the vehicle transports that people get to work, capturing all that is, is really really difficult. But it's all part of, of net zero. So the methodology that we define has, has four different levels, that's a slide I skipped over, that allows people to progress at different speeds. So uh, there's a lot of people doing work on this. Like I said, we're not the only person looking at it. We talk to the other clusters that are doing this work as well. Um, it just needs framing and some kind of, uh, some kind of national context, which is my next big challenge. Because <laughs> that will undoubtedly help with that price correction. So I think sometimes what confuses me is why aren't we doing more in that space? <coughs> and if, if there is a commercial mechanism, then you know the more we purchase, then the cheaper it's going to get. So maybe the issues are you know the whole as I, as I said earlier, this whole CO two ownership, which is which is not easy uh, to do. The other thing, Chris, you talked very heavily about strong stakeholder engagement. My other question would be, what is what is the relationship like between the clusters? Do you share information um, <laughs> frequently? Um, what is that like, the, the learning between the clusters? There's a, there's a lot of engagement done between the clusters. We are, um, and this is where I talk about health and unhealthy competition as well. Yeah. So when you look at phase one cluster sequencing or phase two, which sets well, the clusters in direct competition against each other, and there's good purpose for that. You know, we understand why competition is there and why it's necessary. But um, it does mean that not everybody can progress with their project that will provide that economic benefit for their region. They can't do it straight away. And then we have uh, competition within the clusters as well because there's only a certain number of tickets available for phase two cluster sequencing. Uh, I'm sorry if this terminology is you know, not, not familiar to everybody, but please wrap it break if you, if you want to find out what those all mean. Um, but we, we do have a, a thing between the industrial clusters uh, called the Multi-Cluster Forum, where we get together informally and talk and share information. So that's at one level. And then, um, William, uh, you can tell us about the UK-wide multi, the UK-wide um, uh, Yeah, the UK-wide cluster. And so, um, you know, knowledge sharing is key across our portfolio. And we're very cognizant that, you know, sharing knowledge and learning, we're not talking about commercially sensitive information, but processes and and lessons that have been learnt over things such as you know solvent selection processes. Um, um, Palmer Zero did a, a produced a report on solvent selection processes that they made public. Um, th things like that that we can get out there in the public domain and make this a more cost-effective process. So you know if we're funding 20, 30, 40 emitter projects all to go through the same process. The people who are moving first and taking those early market risks and receiving innovation funding for that, it's it's useful for them to be able to share their learnings from that process. So our knowledge sharing agenda is something that we really do try and push hard as a program. And and, and <coughs> I mentioned that UK wide cluster plans. So all our cluster plans are um, you know doing their individual deep dives um, for their individual uh, clusters. They're looking at all options uh, to decarbonise across the cluster. Um, and then we're going to bring that all together into a, a, a report um, which will essentially be an investment case for the current state of play for UK industrial cluster decarbonisation 
um, in the UK through the, the multi um, cluster um, roadmap, which which will be published um, in about twelve months' time. So that'll be a really powerful, useful um, report for, for the UK, which we won't only just present to Bayes, but um, internationally as well. It'll present the state of play of the UK cluster and industrial decarbonisation. Okay, thanks for that. that. That was a really useful setting the scene, especially in terms of that engagement uh, and knowledge sharing. So the other major thing about uh, uh, talking about in this panel discussion now is supply chain challenges, skills and market certainty. So specifically with hydrogen and CCUS, um, when I look at it, I, I, I think it broadly falls within these three pillars, right? So you've got upstream production, uh, midstream transformation, transport, and downstream end use. From a workforce perspective, we obviously have extensive oil and gas and petrochemical experience. It's about understanding where these people can be plugged in and their skill sets. So, Chris, skill to Chris, what do you think are the key, key steps to ensuring the CCUS and hydrogen supply chain are achieved? And also, where do you see the greatest um, potential for investment and development? Yeah, it's, it's something that's very prevalent and we're looking at now. Um, so these projects are going to head for investment decisions in the next couple of years. So I think Chris mentioned it earlier. The key word is certainty. Yeah, the whole supply chain needs certainty of what's coming. It's a little bit chicken and egg at the moment that we're waiting for projects. So why would uh, a fabricator um, of heat exchanges invest and expand their production facility when there's no certainty uh, that those contracts are coming their way yeah so we we talk um, a lot with um, the supply chain we engage them there's several studies going on with the industrial clusters I mean I, I can give you uh, a couple of examples so um, it's been mentioned before what we're going to be doing is at scale yeah this is um, you've got to realise the scale of what we're trying to achieve with both hydrogen and carbon capture. So you're going to need some large pressure vessels. Yeah, and it's a long time uh, since uh, there's been a demand for that in the UK. Uh, British uh, manufacturing uh, has reduced. We saw some of that uh, on Chris's presentation. How industry has declined, um, but it's still a demand. So uh, in just uh, base business and the refinery. We replace uh, large coke drums, 50 years old, uh, and we replace them at their end of life. Uh, wanted to go to a UK manufacturer, there wasn't one. So we went round, all around the world. So uh, Italy, Spain, India, USA, South Korea, and we ended up going to uh, Japan to get them fabricated. What an opportunity for British industry there, yeah. And we got all that to come. That's going to be multiplied by yeah, several score in terms of demand. Yeah. And that's just for uh, pressure vessels. We talked about electrolyzers as well. I mean, uh, the, the whole supply chain uh, needs to, to have that certainty to invest, to have capacity and capability. Yeah, I think they can. I, mean, I want to quite a bit of private equity on the switch and invest businesses to make basically in the supply chain to the back end let's say the reflective supply of the steel mills or let's say this say pumps compressors right so we are looking into and let's say I cannot confidentiality I cannot say the name we're looking into let's say a large drive business privately and they they sell a lot to the oil and gas industry and they are very scared to touch it first of all they think that okay this oil and gas the other thing is I don't know whether what will happen to the new energy there so that I can repurpose this business for the sorry, new energy. Did you, did you have a market that closes you sorry. Out, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so we're looking into a large drive business who sells a lot to the oil and gas industry. And generally for this type of business, the private equity are generally interested because they think that it's going to be companies like Philips or ArcelorMittal or Cimax and those type of companies so they have a certainty of supply. But when they think that the business is exposed to oil and gas and they don't know whether they can repurpose this business for new energy sector, then they do not want to touch that, right? And as a result, those type of businesses decline, then, as I said, there might not be supply or pressure vessels or pumps or heat exchangers to support your new energy infrastructure. 
another point to make. And so that's on the supply chain of equipment required, but also we need people uh, to build. Yeah, we need those skills. Uh, and that supply chain is stressed today. Uh, with, you know, we've got HS2, we've got Inkley Point, all pulling on the same type of skills we need to uh, build the plant we're talking about. So um, we need, as an industry, to really advocate <coughs> and go into schools, uh, encourage people. Uh, there's a room for <coughs> diversity here. We've really got to have a broad reach and encourage uh, people to come to the industry uh, to build what we want to do. Yes. And um, building on from that, Lindsay Armstrong from the University of Southampton and the Academic Cluster Lead in the Solar Cluster. Um, how important is it that you engage with academia in your roadmap to moving forward? Because we talk about the supply chain, we talk about how we need these skills, but so a lot of these skills are, skills are very specialist and we're going to need some people on the ground through the academic routes as well. So how are you embedding academia into your roadmap? I think, um, yeah, obviously, key in, you know, academia can help with studies such as, you know, public perceptions, which is key for um, you know, getting the public on board. But just thinking off the top of my head, there's a, a really great example from our zero carbon humber project. Um, the AMRC in Sheffield are doing a supply chain mapping piece. They've identified 700 components as part of the hydrogen and CCS um, full scale. A value chain. Um, so they're already starting to think about engaging with suppliers. They're working with Microsoft to develop a digital twin, which will become an open resource tool, um, which can be you know used for the benefit of deployment of CCS and the, the supply chain, which will fill that that um, that that, in, that high level infrastructure. So that's a really good example where academia is complementing some of our you know industrial deployment um, work, and they're obviously other examples as well um, through the IDRIC uh, Industrial Decarbonisation Research and Innovation Centre. Did that yeah. answer the question? Yes. Any others? Go ahead. Hi, um, Anise Gamble from Aurora Energy Research. So it's more of a strategic question on the quest topic of supply chain challenges. Of course, a lot of industries are highly specialised and you rely on different parts from all over the world. Um, although it might not be cost effective in the next five, ten years, is there ever the temptation from your company or the companies you work for to bring some more parts in house? Um, yeah, so maybe you make type A, but you need like many other bits, and then you decide to make those yourself. Sorry if that question was a bit vague. The Lip 66, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I think. Uh, we have a core competency as yeah, what we do. You're talking about engineering skills, manufacturing skills, yeah, and that supply chain. Um, no, that we wouldn't bring some of those skills in um, necessarily, uh, but we do. Yeah, we do uh, employ uh, a core group of people like uh, welders, instrument technicians. So you're always going to get that, but. I think, again, the at-scale question, we are talking about something much, much bigger. You know? um, you know, I'll, I'll carry on the, the, the point I made earlier. I, I think there is uh, hope and stirrings in, in British industry. I know several of the projects and clusters have had supply chain days. We had one with our Amber Zero events. We had 180 UK companies um, attend, and 40 or 60, I can't remember the exact number, we're all from the region, so that in itself it is good because this is a chance. Because we're talking, we haven't mentioned it to, uh, so far today. We're talking these industrial clusters in economically deprived areas. This is a real opportunity for jobs and skills for those populations. Can I just add to that as well? Um, and I think Chris is really a kind of question to you, but my, my perception of the the supply chain engagement we need to do is that. Um, what we're talking about here in these industries is mostly not well, new technology, it's new applications of existing technology. So it's not like we have to build a new supply chain for carbon capture and storage, for example. It's, it's just uh, enabling, giving certainty to the existing supply chain so they can ramp up to, to meet these needs. Is that, is that a reasonable perception? I, I, yes, that's, so there's a base business still needs to go on, but I think, again, we are talking about 
huge investment. Yeah. So the supply chain needs to expand. Yeah. And I, I think the point on on skills. Um, a lot of those skills are transferable. Yeah. Uh, so in industrial facility and refinery, there's a lot of very, very skilled people there already. It's a very complex operation. And you're going to transfer uh, running a process unit and all the support that goes around there with engineers, chemists, IT, everything, uh, onto a carbon capture plant, which is using technology that's actually familiar in industry now. Solvent uh, is, uh, is, is a technique that's used on the refinery today. So it's about transferring those skills over. It's a big opportunity. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. So if you were going to rank it, would you see would you see the biggest issue is still that financial certainty trumping everything else? And when we talk about financial certainty, right now it's purely government, right? And we and the latest in government isn't the most promising. Are there uh, feelers in the marketplace and that, that funding may be at risk? Well, there's, there's, there's two elements to that. There's what, what projects can you actually develop with something and give people certainty to do those projects? And also, uh, what existing industries can you not lose because of the economic pressures? So we already talked about, I had a question this morning about gas price. Um, CF fertilizers, who, who make most of the fertilizer uh, in the UK, uh, they make ammonia for fertilizers uh, earlier in the year, close air. Complete close their operation in Hints, so that was a chunk out of the Hyatt cluster, uh, and they stopped operating their plants in Billingham in the Teeth Valley, um, and they're using that just to import uh, ammonia from uh, from the US. So we've lost those jobs, and the risk is, but we still need fertilizer, right? Um, <laughs> we still need very food to eat. So um, and you, there's lots of examples of this. If we don't create the economic conditions in the UK to allow decarbonise industries to happen, then we just offshore the carbon instead. We end up buying our fertilisers or our steel from somewhere that doesn't have carbon taxes and a regulatory regime, and we just offshore our carbon emissions as well. So you know, there's, that's another aspect of this question. I think the UK steel sector is an interesting one, right? Because UK produces uh, 9 million tonnes of scrap, a large part of it going out of UK, and you make your steel in a carbon neutral way. So the industry structure for some reason has not actually thought about that actually I can use my <coughs> own internally generated scrap rather than just exporting it and then bringing it from Turkey and while well, you are bringing an iron ore and coking coal from Brazil and uh, Australia to make it still carbon intensive way. Right? So, uh, so those are uh, some fundamental things which has not been thought about. Yeah. So we need to go back to those market drivers. Yeah. To, 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 to think about you know, what, what's driving those, those imports and exports in that way and, yeah. and how do you challenge those so you know, if you create more opportunities for green infrastructure projects and people can transfer their business onto green infrastructure yeah. that needs green steel then um, you know you, you create a, a market for them and you can address some of those challenges that way. Yeah. Actually, I was just wondering in the work you do at BWC do you see do you see anything as like a silver bullet solution or is it really a mirage of solutions that's going to get really difficult sectors to decarbonize? Yeah, I think there is no silver bullet. I think the silver bullet would be if you get an unlimited supply of green power or fusion or something that you could get that. Yeah, that we have the silver bullet most probably, otherwise we don't have it. <laughs> right. So when we work with companies, we typically we look into different aspects. First of all, <coughs> let's look at how much you can grow. You think of this available technology you already have, and can you bring it to your uh, regular capex replacement cycle? And how much you can do through energy efficiency? You can do a lot actually in the AI and big data. Some yeah. few companies don't understand that. So let's pull those levers, and then we ask them, okay, let's look into the more breakthrough technology, look, understand the margin and available cost curve. Yeah, my and then understand how does, depending on the timing of the technology, and infrastructure is a critical question to that. For example, we're having some conversation with clients. They completely understand what they need to do. They understand their bank cards, but they don't know whether, whether I will get the right infrastructure to actually bring those technology into my manufacturing plant. How my future network of, let's say, steel plant or cement plant should look like 
on the back row, that CCUS network on the back row, hydrogen supply on the back row, the biomass supply, right? So that's a conundrum. Yeah. Sorry, Chris. But as, as well as um, technology silver bullet solutions that you described there, I think there's um, the policy silver bullet is to understand that net zero is the same thing as levelling up, it's the same thing as GB energy security, and that these things overlap really, really heavily because the, you know, the money we need to spend on these projects is in, in industrial areas, which are typically prime, and they're levelling up. And we need to invest in hydrogen, making hydrogen domestically uh, rather than having it all imported, so we, we you know, address energy security problems. And of course those are both net zero. The three things are, 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 are the same thing. I think the, 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 the better that is talked about in, in the same sphere uh, by, by governments, by policy makers, and the better that the general public have understanding that these aren't separate things. And you know, we need to get rid of net zero because it's too expensive. We need to spend money on building up instead. Well, they're the same thing. You know, it's, it's, it's one and the same. It is. <laughs> and the quicker people understand that, the, uh, the easier, isn't it? Um, sorry, any more questions from the audio? Oh, okay. Two came up at the same time. <laughs> Lady at the back. Hi, uh, my name is Baby. I'm from Imperial College, London. Um, from where, sorry? Imperial College. Imperial. Imperial. Yes. So my question is around the uncertainty as well as the policy silver bullet. Mm. So uh, when William was giving this presentation, I was thinking, okay, these are for demonstration projects where you have learning by innovations. At the end of these projects are the learnings or the cost reduction as a result of these learnings. Are they sufficient to sustain them until the market takes over? And then I listened to your presentation, Chris, and discovered there is a gap which is doing the net zero regulator. And then I had the first presentation on policy, very much um, on it providing infrastructure. So there seems to be gaps everywhere that, and these gaps create more uncertainty. So even if there's going to be an expansion of the supply chain, there is still this gap, because at the end of the day, policy is an enabler, and net zero seems to be driven uh, by policy because the technologies have always existed. And we know how to use CCS, we understand hydrogen, and there's still, it's not a breakthrough technology, it's probably a breakthrough use. Um, so, I guess the, my question is how do you synthesize or join all these projects together to create policy certainty? Because if your funding comes to an end next year, then there's a gap. If the end of the demonstration project, the markets don't take over, then there is a gap. And then we have like 28 years to 2050. So is the main, should the main challenge be trying to ensure that there is some form of synthesis or there's some form of collaboration such that there's an increased political certainty or policy certainty or should the focus be on um, the supply chains, for instance, or skills? Because if there is no policy certainty, then there is no skill and there will be no supply chain. I think the common thread across everything is energy security. And you begin to see how you said net zero is driven by policy. It's an interesting one, one up until the war, and now you've got people, you know, ringing me literally constantly in that what can we do to reduce our energy consumption? And so you're, you're already you know, killing two birds at one stone, aren't you? You're reducing energy consumption, you're making your emissions lower. So sometimes I think when it comes to energy security and decarb, when, when they're coming to the fore, you know, what, how do you decide which is more important of the two? Um, but personally, that's, that's my thoughts, that it's energy security and the, the price of, of uh, the sparks regulations of how bad they are. That's what's going to drive everything, and I think eventually become that connectivity uh, amongst all of the different jigsaw puzzles that she was talking about. But any thoughts? Yeah, I think there's been a precedent set. Uh, maybe it answers your question in offshore wind. Yeah. So that maybe didn't have perfection in policy to start off with. It took a couple of goes to get there, but now with the CFD um, uh, basis. Uh, I believe it works very well, and I think we're going to. That's kind of a framework for what we're talking about here. Yeah. Yeah, I think you know, just on the point of CCS, it's not commercially viable. You know, 
limited companies wouldn't do it without you know, that government seed and, and confidence at the beginning. I think we absolutely need to get behind the CCS because as the Climate Change Committee said, you know, without the wide scale roll, roll out of CCS, we won't achieve net zero. It's a fundamental technology for high emitting industries in the UK where CO2 is part of the chemistry of an industrial process. There's no way of getting around it without capturing and storing emissions for like steel and cement. So I think, you know, our funding programs are aligned, so projects are currently undergoing feed. Um, they'll then move into the CCS infrastructure fund, which is that billion pound government commitment from Bayes, access to business models, so regulated asset base, contracts for difference. Um, and then there's opportunities as well to think about how the UK can be a CO2 hub, so importing CO2 from shipping, export of our goods and services, and then also combining hydrogen, um, blue hydrogen with CCS to make scalable business models to create this um, into an industry that's that's fundamentally profitable that, that brings down the levelised cost of transport and storage of, of CO2. So that government you know, investment at the start is supposed to get industry over that initial hurdle um, and then ultimately we want to create this as a self-sustaining you know, CCS industry where the UK is essentially a, a world leader on, on the global stage.